All right, ladies and gents, let's get started uh, with today's lecture. What we're going to do today is I'm going to sort of hopefully finish um, talking about poetry and then we'll kind of straight move on to the novel because as I said last week, sort of the romantic period which where we're still stuck in basically, at least you know, from a historical point in time when we go through the histor uh, history of British literature. Um, the novel and poetry and a very particular kind of poetry were some of the more significant developments during that time. So what we've ended up, well, what we ended with last week was that we were talking about the rhyme scheme as well as the meter, so, so to speak, the phonetic or the uh, phonological level of a poem. And I think I went off on a bit of a tangent last week um, because the question was, you know, if we talk about, you know, rhetoric or... Uh, uh, rhetorical devices and figures of speech and the rhyme scheme and internal rhymes and in this case you can see the um, alliteration that I've highlighted here. The question is why are we analyzing this and why do we need to look at these kinds of um, parts or aspects of a poem and I said that I don't want you to know them by heart. That doesn't mean that I don't want you to know them at all. Um, I have also uploaded a glossary, so if you have questions and if you want to look up some of the rhetorical devices, you can find them on Opal in the materials folder. The thing is, um, the, or the point of this exercise isn't so much that you know all of these things and can sort of highlight each and every rhyme scheme and the meter and every sort of um, uh, figure of speech in a poem. So it's not a analyze it, go through it, and then list 25 metaphors you can find in a poem. That's not ne necessarily the point of the exercise. The thing is, what these things, or what, what the meter does, what the rhythm, what sounds, phonological level, uh, but also the semantic level do, is they have a certain function. So the point of poetry and the point of these aspects isn't to know them, but to know their function. What do they do? Um, how do they actually give us a deeper meaning than just the surface level? Because usually we, as students, but also as literary studies people, we kind of get stuck on the surface level. We describe the content and we don't go deeper. But metaphors, personifications, they give us the ability to actually delve a bit deeper, to go beyond the surface level of simply describing the content. And they give us, again, a deeper meaning of the subject matter that is part of the poem. And we're going to go through one, of, one example, or you're going to go through one example in a bit more detail in a moment. So, We've ended with the, with the rhyme scheme, um, both internal rhymes and end rhymes. Just to freshen up your memory, that would be the end rhyme and the sort of uh, rhyming couplet. Uh, that is that the last word or the last uh, stressed syllables of a line do rhyme. Um, and this, or thus though from truth, it's not necessarily an internal rhyme, but it is a internal or an internal rhyme scheme that is the alliteration in which the consonants sort of rhyme in some form. And I think I've given you a second example that would be if the vowels are sort of rhyming or if the vowels are similar in a line, that would be the assonance. And I've given you the example uh, from Spamalot, from Monty Python's Spamalot. Not going to read that out in this case, but in um, ham, jam, spam, it's the same R sound that we see over and over again in this verse or in this line. Um, I'm just going to move on to, um, or move back to Dr. Syntax, and not so much the morphological level. So the morphological level is mostly about not the syntax, but the way words are repeated. So for instance, if every line would start with thus, that would be more of a morphological, or that would be part of the morphological level. It's about repetition, word formation, and word usage. This is not something we necessarily find in this poem. We are going to find that in a later poem. But what we certainly find is, or what we can sort of trace, is the syntactic level of the poem. And the syntactic level is simply that, namely how are sentences split um, and how are they sort of ordered in the poem. So in this case, uh, those last uh, four lines, he never will as an artist shine who copies nature line by line. Whoever from nature takes a view must copy and improve her too. That is one sentence, and it's also one coherent, um, sort of a coherent part where, where we find some kind of internal, well, coherence, but also concentration. So it's one, I think in German you call that Sinnabschnitt, so that belongs together, it's one sentence. And usually 
um, when it comes to the syntactic structure of a poem, we see, uh, well, comita, we have the punctuation that usually hints at coherence and sentence structure. So syntactic level is just that, the um, syntactic level or the, the sentence structure of the poem. But again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'm going to um, give you an example for the morphological level first, as well as the syntactic level, um, especially in a poem or in a in this case, it's again the song by Spamalot, where that becomes a bit more clear what I mean by morphological level and by syntactical level, perhaps. Um, so again, we have, so try your luck in Camelot, run, uh, run amok in Camelot, it doesn't suck in Camelot, we're nice at the round table, we dance whenever we're able, etc., etc. What, um, again, the morphological level is that Camelot um, is repeated over and over again, as well as we, so we, the knights of the round table, that is usually used in the beginning of each line, and that gives you a certain sequence of what happens, what do they do, and it's mostly like a bullet point or a bullet structure where they go like, we do this, then we do that, then we do that, etc., etc. So that's the morphological level in the sense of things are repeated. That can be words that are repeated, in this case we, um, but if for instance, um, especially if you look at the larger poem, which you can't look at because I haven't put it on the slide, but um, so Try Your Luck in Camelot is repeated multiple times throughout the song, and that would again be on a morphological level, the repetition of word formations and certain phrases. On the syntactical level, and again, um, just as a side note, we have the end rhyme here, right? It's a bit of a weird mix, so it's not as easy to, to kind of see as it was in the Tour of Dr. Syntax where you have rhyming couplets in end rhyme, but in this case you have end rhymes but also an interlocking or embracing rhyme in the sense of that table able rhymes, then you've got scenes and then you've got cable. So again, you have the embraced rhyme that is the able, table, cable, etc. We also see a very pretty good example for an internal rhyme that's routine and scenes or we have um, we do routines and gory scenes. There is an internal rhyme that we find here, um, which is not necessarily the repetition of ham, jam, spam, or thus, though. So it's not an alliteration, it's not an assonance, but it's um, an internal rhyme in this very line. On a syntactic level, we have, again, the sentence structure is that we're knights of the round table until that are too hot for cable. That is one sentence. We don't necessarily find interpunctuation here, um, so it makes it pretty hard to kind of figure out where does a sentence start and where does a sentence end. But if you look for coherent um, sentence structures in the sense of where does you know, one action take place, where does another action start? That is usually where you get into the syntactic level. So try to sort of split up poems into parts and aspects of coherence um, throughout. So each and every stanza, for instance, often is either one sentence, so a stanza can be one of these coherent um, aspects of a poem, but usually we find, especially in poems that have no stanzas, we have to kind of put in a bit more work to figure out where coherence lies and where coherent um, sentence structures, for instance, end. So just to give you a little too long, didn't read or didn't listen, um, there are three levels, which I said last week. So first, we have the visual level. If you remember the poem that was shaped like a penguin or that was shaped like an altar, as well as the poem about the leaf that falls down, um, that sort of personifies in some form the loneliness that is being talked about in this poem, we find the visual level. So this is purely about how poems are structured visually. So what do they look like? And that should usually be your first step if you want to analyze and interpret a poem. What does it look like? Does the shape, for instance, already hint at the content? How does the shape maybe subvert the content? So if it's um, you know, a poem shaped like a penguin and it's about polar bears, that would be a subversion of what you perceive to be the content of the poem. So structure as well as visual art, so to speak, is quite important. It doesn't mean that it transcends the content, but both need to be tied in with one another. But visual level and visual dimension should be the, the start of your analyses, usually. Um, the second one is what we've, or what I've gone through, that is the rhythmic acoustic dimension of a poem. And this is sort of what we've kind of 
exemplified or what I try to show you with the example of Dr. Syntax, namely that this is the musical aspect of a poem and there is the phonological level, meaning the sound, the meter, the, um, yeah, the sound, meter, rhyme scheme, etc. Um, the morphological level, that is the repetition of certain words, formations, um, idioms, etc., etc. And the last one is the syntactic level, that is the sentence arrangement, enjambment, etc., etc. So this is purely on a how does the poem sound and how does the poem sort of read to you. And it's, of course, you know, poetry is something that can be read in silence, but it can also be read out. And usually, as it is with drama, as it is with plays, usually it has a different kind of, um, a different kind of feeling if you read it out loud, because then you can definitely easily see the meter, the rhyme scheme, the rhythm of this poem. Um, and last but not least, the third level, that is the schematic level, or the lexical textual lexical thematic dimension, that is where we see figures of speech, where metaphors, personifications, etc., etc., sort of fall in. And again, I've said that I don't want you to know all of them, but some of them. Um, and this is sort of the question, and this is also where poetry gets usually really hard, because that is what you know, a German, a German uh, lecturer would call a Transferleistung. This is where you have to move on from the language and you have to look for the so-called deeper meaning. And that's usually pretty vague if we talk about poetry having some kind of deeper meaning, because what does that even mean? How do we go beyond the surface level? So, which brings me to the question of how do I actually analyze poetry? How do I go about that? Again, as I've said, the first part should be you describe the poem. What is the poem about? How is it structured? What does it look like visually? Um, that is the first thing. You don't go too much into detail in this very step. It's a pretty basic and pretty surface level step at first. Um, usually, by the way, if you look at any sort of text, you would go uh, through the same three steps that is describe, analyze, and interpret. First step when it comes to poetry is, of course, the visual presentation, the content, as well as the speech situation. Who speaks? Uh, who is addressed? What is the communicative situation that we find in the poem? The second step moves a bit further and a bit more deeper. That's the analysis. And the analysis sort of focuses on the middle part or the second dimension of poetry. So what's the, uh, the rhythm? What's the rhyme scheme? What's the meter? That's kind of, and again, I'm saying this is a, or an idealized way of moving or of, of dealing with poetry because the lines between description and analyses and analyses and interpretation are pretty blurry. So take that with a grain of salt, what I'm saying here, because that sounds like it's very, you know, one step, then the other, then the other. Um, but an, generally, analyses, that is the question of what does the rhyme scheme actually do? So this is where we move beyond, oh, that's an end rhyme, but we ask ourselves, okay, why is it an end rhyme? Is it about um, sort of creating coherence? Is it about creating a certain impression? So if you think about, for instance, Gottfried, uh, Gottfried Benn's um, poetry, usually that po or those poems are about pretty dark sort of thematic matters. It's about death and dying and it's pretty horrible and pretty gory, but the rhyme scheme and the rhythm of these poems is very sort of flowy, very nice, very rhythmic in some case. So what does the rhythm, what does the meter actually do? Does it create something or an impression? You know, we're talking about a nice matter and then suddenly the content sort of crops up and it's really, really dire and really difficult and really horrible. So there can be a, a discrepancy between form and function, so to speak. Um, also, that is where you focus on, anal of the, on the sort of um, occurrence of figures of speech. What kinds of figures of speech can you actually find? How are they structured? Where do, where, where do they lie? Where are they sort of um, organized? And how are they organized? Which brings me to the last step, that is the interpretation. So that is where we really ask, what is the poem actually about? So if we have the uh, uh, tour of Dr. Syntax, it's on the surface, it's about you know, a clergyman or a teacher sort of going with his, with his horse and sort of um, having certain adventures in the English countryside. That would be the surface level. But if we go into a deeper analysis, we see that on the one hand, it's about the question of what is actually picturesque. What should an artist do? What's the point of an artist? What is the um, sort of the idea of the aesthetic narration and the aesthetic 
uh, rendering of, for instance, the English countryside. What is the purpose of an artist? Is the purpose of an artist to copy nature line by line or to make it fancy? But what does it do with nature if what we get is a mediated look at nature? Is it still true nature? So that is where we sort of get into the nitty gritty details of what the poem is actually about that transcends what we see on the surface content level. Um, this is also, and that comes much later because right at the moment you don't have theory as of yet, but this is where eventually theory comes in. So if we look at Dr. Syntax, it is notable that it's written from the point of view of a man. What does that tell us about the artist? What does that tell us about gender relations in the 18th century, for instance? Namely that women weren't allowed to have these grand tours or to have tours throughout the English countryside at all. So this is where interpretation or where theory eventually kind of slides in and where you start to combine theoretical ideas as well as the poem and the sort of the structure of a poem. So this is where you kind of put all of these puzzle pieces together to form a coherent picture in this case. Do you have any questions? Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. I saw someone yawning, so I'm presuming that you have no questions, but you want me to go on. Um, and you know, because it's Tuesday morning and you obviously <clears throat> like poetry, we're going to, and I mean, that's why I'm asking, so this is where you have to you know, do some work yourself, because we're going to look at a different poem right here. And that is a poem by Robert W. Service, whom you don't know because no one ever knows a Robert W. Service except for, well, yeah, I mean, you do, of course, but you have to do a presentation about it, so does that really count? Um, but uh, Robert uh, W. Service, it's actually not a British writer, but don't tell anyone he's a Canadian writer, and he writes about usually uh, polar exploration, the Arctic, and death and dying, which is exactly my kind of thing. Um, so I'm just going to read it out and then I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to read through it and sort of go through a surface level interpretation. That is, go through who speaks, what are the phonological, morphological, syntactic dimensions, uh, what about the uh, lexical, thematic dimension, that is theme, imaginary, um, you know, what figures of speech are being used. It's just, a, you don't have to go in depth if you want to, feel free to do so, but maybe not in the next 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, service writes, this is the law of the Yukon, and ever she makes it plain. Send not your foolish and feeble, send me your strong and your sane. Strong for the red rage of battle, sane for I harry them sore. Send me men girt for combat, men who are grit to the core. Swift as the panther in triumph, fierce as the bear in defeat, sired of a bulldog parent, steeled in the furnace heat. Send me the best of your breeding, lend me your chosen ones, them I will take to my bosom, them I will call my sons. Them I will gild with my treasure, them I will glut with my meat. The, uh, but the others, the misfits, the failures, I tremble under my feet. Dissolute, damned and despairful, crippled and pale-sealed and slain, ye would uh, send me the spawn of your gutters, go take back your spawn again. Um, so again, you've got 10 minutes, read through it again, talk to whomever sits next to you, um, and yes, exactly, if there are two people on the row, you of course have no choice, but generally uh, talk to the person next to you, go through each an individual sort of um, dimension, and then we'll kind of get back together in 10 minutes, and I want to hear your take on this, on this poem. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, of course, feel free to ask me.
I presume now that you're getting a bit quieter, you're kind of at the end of the exercise, hopefully. Um, which is why I'm just going to jump straight back in and I'm going to ask you. So first of all, we said, you know, we need to describe the poem and kind of go at poetry sort of from the outside. So first of all, what is the poem about? Yes. Yep, it's about uh, the gold rush in the Yukon. Yes, that's about that. Um, who speaks in the poem? Maybe someone else. Yep. Yeah, so it's a lyrical eye that is the Yukon. Is there more to the speech situation than just the Yukon speaking? Which is kind of obvious because you've got the inverted commas right here. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a lyrical I that speaks in the first line. This is the law of the Yukon, and ever she makes it plain. That's a frame narrative or a sort of a narrator that creates this frame narrative. So the speech situation changes from the first line to the second line, from a sort of lyrical eye that is narrating the story, or the, the uh, narration in this case, to the Yukon herself, who speaks and who directly addresses the reader or the implied reader in this case. So speech situation is both a lyrical eye as in a narrator, and then it changes to the lyrical eye being the Yukon. Okay. What about the rhythmic and acoustic dimension? What about the phonological level there? You know, right, not meter, but rhyme scheme, um, et cetera, et cetera. Who wants to have a go? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, could you give me an example, for instance? Yeah, perfect. It's, um, I think in, in this case, it kind of personifies the nature of the Yukon. It's a very harsh sound that, you know, you start with a very hard consonant. Um, it's a very um, sort of immediate start, so that kind of personifies the rough nature of, well, the Yukon herself, yeah? So we start with send, strong, swift, sired, send, them, them, but the others, which kind of does not fit the bill, but yeah. Um, what else? Anything else you find interesting, we have the end rhyme, we have uh, the sort of similar consonants in the beginning. What else do we have? Do we have any internal rhymes, for instance? <laughs> and everyone's like, I'm reading this poem for the first time. Okay, just going to go on. So we have, for instance, guild and glut. That's very similar to consonants. So we've got two consonants or two or more consonants that are being repeated um, with little change. And we have that twice. We have gird and grit and guild and glut. Uh, we also have an internal rhyme that is send and lend. Send me the best of your breeding. Lend me your chosen ones. Um, that's an internal rhyme in this case. Um, we also have the alliteration um, in the second to last line that is dissolute, damned, and despairful. Uh, we also have that in the third line, the red rage of battle. And as you so rightly said, we have an end rhyme, plain, sane, sore, core, defeat, heat, one, sons, meet, and feet. Um, again, um, this is a rhyming couplet and an end rhyme. So we've got both internal rhymes and end rhymes in this case with a very traditional rhyming couplet um, forming the basis of it. Um, what about the morphological level? 
actually got that far to look at that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Resounding silence, um, which is which is fair, I suppose. Um, yes. Uh, that would be the syntactic level. That's more of a of a um, sort of the sentence structure, but that's correct. The interpunctuation. Um, we've got the the um, the colon, and then we've got sort of the semicolon and the uh, the commata. So that's very long sentences in this case that we find here with a lot of uh, I think Gedankenstriche and you know a, another sentence being added to it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got send not your strong and your foolish, send me men, uh, send me the best, them I will take, them I will call, them I will guilt, them I will glut. So this is again repeated over and over again. So we find um, on the morphological level a parallelism where the same phrase is repeated in the beginning of a line or in the middle or at, even at the end of a line. So there's always a constant repetition of the same phrase that we find in this poem. Um, the syntactic level I've already sort of uh, talked about, it's pretty long sentences where one coherent sentence is, for instance, the first uh, six lines, which is even for a poem pretty long, and you need, or technically you need each and every line in order for the entire sentence to make sense. Um, what about the lexical and thematic level? Or maybe even something that you found or you you know, from the rhythm, from the way words are being used that you found familiar, for instance. Although that's probably pretty out there, which you might not even know. What are figures of speech that you found most notable in this very short excerpt of the poem? That sort of means, did you find any of them? Oh, sorry, I didn't see that raise hand. It was just too far away. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, for instance. Mm hmm. Uh, could you give me an example for a simile and an uh, example for a metaphor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we find these similes um, that make the, the people, or in, not the people in this case, but the Yukong herself, um, a very animalistic sort of um, personification or a very animalistic sort of place where panthers and, and bears, you know, that's predators. So this is sort of a, a comparison between predators that we find in the animal kingdom and the Yukong. So the Yukong is inherently dangerous, a predator that will take your life if you stay there for too long, for instance. Um, uh, what I and I'm going to give you another example and one of the metaphors that I would like to go into more detail about is sired of a bulldog parent steeled in the furnace heat. But, but before I come to that, um, there is, and this is again a, a sort of second side note that I'm doing here, and I mean you've right now, you know, you, you've become familiar with my side notes. Um, I'm going to make that very short, but it's interesting that especially during the time Robert Service writes, um, we still find, as you've so rightly noted, the gold rush. So there is the kind of imperialist agenda to the Yukon. They need to be, or it needs to be conquered, it needs to be exploited. So we find very similar uh, imagery to what we find, for instance, earlier in the 19th century when it comes to poetry about India, about Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's just very quickly, if you talk, talk quietly enough so that I don't have the whispering all the time because it's really difficult to talk against that. All right, um, going back to the, to the poem, which is interesting, and there is a very interesting and very sort of, at least for people 
in the know a very explicit intertextual reference. And I'm going to very briefly get into intertextuality. And the reference I mean is the following. Send me the best of your breeding, lend me your chosen ones, them I will take to my bosom, them I will call my sons. And for you, that might not really necessarily say anything other but, you know, it's an end rhyme. It's, you know, just two lines from this poem, which is interesting because it's an sort of implicit reference to Rudyard Kipling's White Man's Burden. Anyone's ever heard of it or read it? Uh, that was quick. Um, did you recognize that there is a similarity or was it just a didn't recognize at all? Yeah, all right. Don't ma doesn't matter, don't worry about that. But there is an implicit intertextual reference to the white man's burden because Rudyard Kipling writes, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best you breed, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captive's need. And what I'm referring to or what I'm focusing on is the best you breed and the sons. And this is repeated in the poem. And later in the Law of the Yukon, this is repeated similarly implicitly. And intertextuality, and this is something you'll, you'll find in both in cultural studies and in literature studies, is sim simply the idea that texts consist of other texts. So every time you read text, it's never, you know, it's never in a vacuum. It's, it never really uh, is an idealized text that has no references to other texts. If you look at fairy tales, for instance, all of the fairy tales start with once upon a time. If you watch then again Shrek the movie from 2001, you find that, again, it starts with once upon a time and then starts like a pretty traditional fairy tale before, you know, the page of the book is ripped out um, and sort of the, the actual movie starts. And this is exactly what I mean by intertextuality or what scholars have meant by intertextuality, namely that texts always reference and consist of other texts. And um, just a brief thing. So, again, with, with, the, uh, with the poem I've just shown you, for me, I read it and I thought, you know, it's the, it's the weird comment by Captain America. I understood that reference. You know, you read something and you're like, wait, I know that. I know that I've read it somewhere. And this is exactly what intertextuality sort of does. It implies and references and alludes to other texts all the time. Um, there are scholars that have said that texts always consist simply of snippets of other texts, which, you know, makes them really not original. So if you read Kristeva, for instance, she says that. Um, but usually intertextuality means that texts simply allude and reference other texts. So every time you go, I understood that reference and I'm going to go to, or I'm going to um, take Evan just as an example in a moment. Um, this is exactly what intertextuality or your knowledge, if it's implicit or explicit, doesn't really matter. Um, but this is what your knowledge of other texts does. And the more texts you know, the more and the deeper and the more explicit your interpretations can, for instance, become. So just to give you the, the sort of uh, the definition of intertextuality, that is the term intertextuality, and I'm just going to read that from the slide so that I don't have to turn around every five seconds. Um, so intertextuality is used to signify the multiple ways in which any one literary text is in fact made up of other texts by means of its open or its covered citations and allusions, its repetitions and transformations of the formal and substantive features of earlier texts, or simply its unavoidable participation in the common stock of linguistic and literary conventions. One conventions would be, for instance, starting a fairy tale with Once Upon a Time. Um, and procedures that are always ready. So that's, this is sort of in our cultural memory that we generally use these kinds of conventions um, in place and constitute the discourses into which we are born. Um, and because I've used the uh, Captain America reference, I understood that reference, I'm just going to give you the example of um, Avengers, which I can't because... So, um, Avengers movie... There are multiple levels of intertextuality that we see, especially, and I'm just going to reference the first one. It's not just the I understood that reference, but if, you, if you're familiar with the movie, then, for instance, Thor is usually referenced as Prison Break, which, of course, refers to the movie with Patrick Swayze, because Thor in this movie kind of looks like Patrick Swayze, which probably just in the eyes of Tony Stark. But generally, this is one intertextual reference by a pretty explicit allusion to a different text, namely a movie from the 1990s, I believe. Um, 
The same thing goes with musical intertextuality. So Tony Stark listens to ACDC, for instance. Again, intertextuality, because some of the lines of ACDC movies are taken up as um, dialogue fragments. Um, a different level of intertextuality would be, for instance, on a broader and medial scale. The Avengers is, of course, not an original work as such, but it's based on different comics and it is based on different movies. So we only know about Captain America and Black Widow because we've seen them in other movies. We only know about Iron Man because we've seen him in other movies. And he's been characterized, or these characters have been characterized before. So if you go into Avengers never having watched uh, Captain America or uh, Iron Man, then understanding Avengers and the motivations and the relationships between the characters may be pretty difficult, simply because you don't know the intertextual references. If you've never seen Prison Break, the Patrick Swayze comment will not do much for you. You might wonder, like, yeah, sure, great, but have no idea. It might be just a weird nickname by Tony Stark for Thor. But if you know the movie, you, of course, also know what Tony Stark is referencing. So intertextuality doesn't mean that you need to catch every reference. It just means that if you catch them, um, there is a deeper meaning of the text that can be sort of extracted by the reference to intertextual um, or by the intertextual reference themselves. So again, if we move back to um, the to sort of the, the um, send me the best of your breeding and send me the best you breed. Um, this is not just similar, but it is of course similar in the sense of the sort of thematic level. So the white man's burden is about white men, the British in this case, needing to civilize other cultures, needing to um, you know, civilize and educate the savages and the uncivilized um, that they have ruled and they have garnered with the empire. So the, uh, the captives need, so to speak, the captives are being called half devil and half child. So there is the idea of education, of civilization. And this is something that is referenced here because the people that come to the Yukon, that, you know, sort of search for gold and want to explore the Yukon, they do actually the same thing with the, either the natives, but also with the nature that they find there. They try to civilize it. They try to build huts. Um, and generally, it's also interesting that the sort of the white man's burden is about, of course, middle class and upper class people going to the colonies and civilizing them because they have the sort of the, the cultural capital to do that. And in this case, the Yukon makes the same kind of claim. It doesn't want to have the dissolute, damned, and despairful. It wants to have the best year breed. So there's a, a link between Rudyard Kipling's White Man's Burden and Robert, R. Uh, Robert uh, W. Service's Law of the Yukon. And I'm going to uh, give you sort of um, a very second brief excurse um, on the matter of metaphors. So what I'm going to focus on is side of a bulldog parent steeled in the furnace heat. Um, if you had to interpret that, how would you go about that? Are there references you immediately get, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would also be someone who comes from a industrialized country, for instance. You know, the furnace heat and the steel uh, making that is a 19, sort of a weirdly 19th century reference to industrialized states, but it would also very well go with a battle hardened person, someone who can stand the heat in this case and who's steeled enough to do that. Yeah. Where do these men come from? I mean, I've already kind of said it, but that becomes evident in this metaphor. The reference to the bulldog parent. Um, the bulldog parent in this case would be a reference to John Bull. I'm going to get into um, what that means in a moment. But John Bull, for instance, would be indeed the reference to that. The bulldog parent is, of course, Britain and the British Isles. Um, 
And when we talk about metaphors, we usually have two kinds of, of levels and two, two kinds of dimensions to the uh, metaphor. I'm just going to give you that. So one, we have the source domain that provides the vehicle. So what I say is sired of a bulldog parent, steeled in the furnace heat. That is just on a linguistic level. That's what I'm saying. But the question is, what do I mean by that? And that's the Tina, so to speak, of the, of, the met, uh, of the metaphor. That's the target domain that holds the Tina. What do I mean by that? And this is somewhere where salient features in the middle are important because they do the transfer for you. If you have never heard of John Bull and if you don't know anything about 19th century, uh, the representations of Britain in the 19th century, interpreting this metaphor might get a bit difficult. Um, and here is the reference to John Bull. John Bull is usually a representation, a very much 19th century representation of Britain, uh, where John Bull is not necessarily a benevolent character, but he's kind of stupid, he's gluttonous, he kind of um, takes up a lot of, not just a lot of space, but it, he eats more than he can actually stomach, which is, in this case, a weird imperial reference there. Um, he's also really xenophobic, very much insular. He's very narrow-minded. Sometimes he's also, and you can see that with the waistcoat and the way he's portrayed, he's also a gentleman. So there's a, there's a strange kind of comment on the upper middle class in Britain during a certain period of time. And this is a very usual way of representing Britain, even nowadays. If it's not Britannia, it's definitely John Bull. So what it does is, on the one hand, you have the bulldog parent, which doesn't say much. But knowing about the bulldog parent, knowing about John Bull, you have certain characteristics, which are salient features in the middle. Um, and this is sort of a reference to Britain. So what I mean is I want to describe Britain in a certain way, and I use bulldog parent. And the bulldog parent, by reference to John Bull, has certain characteristics. And this is exactly the, what I call the transfer license. This is where certain characteristics from what I say are transferred to what I mean. Because what I implicitly do by saying they are sired by a bulldog parent, namely the men that come there, they probably have very much of the same characteristics as you know, John Bull. They probably take up much more than they need. They will be an imperial force. They will probably uh, be xenophobic and insular. They will not talk to, uh, talk to natives, for instance. They'll be uh, xenophobic towards them, etc., etc. So this is the transfer that happens when we talk about metaphors, because metaphors aren't like similes. It's not like a panther or like a bear, but it's a covered kind of comparison. I'm not saying Britain is narrow-minded and not, uh, you know, not a liberal country, but I'm saying that, you know, kind of, I circumvent calling England narrow-minded, but I'm doing it by implication through this metaphor. Is that clear what I mean by that? <laughs> that was a huh, kind of. Anyone, any questions so far? You know, this is your chance, ask them. Okay, so, and this is what I sort of, when I said we need to interpret that, of course you might not know a lot about the imperial enterprise in the 19th century, and I don't expect you to know that. But if you interpret a poem, this is exactly what I mean by the deeper level. It's not just about the Yukon, it's not just about gold mining, it's about much more, it's an implicit comment on the British imperial enterprise, which we only know and which we can only interpret if we have either intertextual references or if we go into a bit more depth on the figures of speech. So, and you might have noticed that I, oh yeah, come on, uh, that I didn't go into much detail about the damned and despairful and about the rhymes and the rhythm, etc., etc., or about the other metaphors, but I focused on one metaphor and there's a lot you can extract from simply one line. And this is what you ought to do. I didn't focus on the other metaphors simply because they are so not significant for the argument I wanted to make. And this is the point of everything we've done so far when it comes to poetry. What is your argument? What do you want to find out? And how do all these aspects sort of add to that? Um, the damned, dis uh, dissolute, damned and despairful, and then you have crippled and palsied and slain. So that's a very different rhythm that is being created. So 
you know, what do these features mean? What do they do? What is their function? Because we, of course, focus far more on the dissolute, damned, and despairful simply because that's a certain rhythm to it. The end by cripple, uh, when it comes to crippled and palsied and slain, that kind of takes us out of that rhythm. So the focus of this line is on the first three sentence, uh, on the first three words. Why do the uh, poem wants us to focus on it? Why does the poem use sired of a bulldog parent? Why doesn't it simply say they come from Britain? I mean, obviously it doesn't rhyme the, the same way, but why does it use this sort of metaphor? What is the point of using these things? And this is where we go into the interpret, uh, in the, into the interpret, uh, to, oh, come on, it's Tuesday morning, into the interpretation. This is sort of where we figure out why are these things used? Why are they put in connection to one another? Um, and this is sort of what you ought to do and, you know, if you're in your first year and your first semester, that's pretty difficult and you might be pretty confused and it's really daunting. Don't worry, that is something that gets easier the more often you do it, which is why you'll probably have to do it in the tutorial, simply so that you practice. That's a skill you acquire by practice. And that's also, you know, if you, if you tend to read and if you study for the longest for the longest time, that sounds really awful, but generally, the longer you study, the more texts you know, the more intertextual references you get. Again, no one expects you to know all of these things you know, by your first reading, but generally, that is something you need to practice and you need to put into relation. Form and content together sort of makes the meaning of a poem. Again, any questions concerning poetry? Um, is it a question of what do we do in the final exam or is it a general question of what do we do if we get a poem? No, just a, a question in the final exam would be like, don't give a reference in the text. Let's put it like this. We're going to go through some of the theory, so we're going to go through orientalism and gender theory, etc., so, etc. Et so you will have certain references, but I don't expect you to immediately know Ooh, bulldog parent, yep, that's John Paul. I mean, now I expect you to know it because I've, you know, I've talked about it in the, in the lecture. Um, but usually if there's something that really needs an intertextual or a you know, deeper meaning knowledge, then I would give that to you, but I'm not going to take a poem where I'm sure that no one knows what the fuck the poem is about. So this is not what I'm going to do, simply because you need to do it in a short amount of time. Um, you've got 90 minutes. I'm not going to give you the law of the Yukon and then go like, and now, in 10 minutes, everything. That's not what, mm -mm, not going to do that. Um, again, everyone has their own reading when it comes to poetry. So um, a friend of mine, for instance, didn't catch the white man's burden reference. And only when I read it out, she's like, huh, yeah, sounds familiar. Um, but again, you know, uh, it depends on how much foreknowledge you come with at the text, so to speak. Uh, again, Avengers example, if you know the rest of the movies that came before it, Avengers may, will make a lot more sense than if you come at the movie without that kind of foreknowledge, okay? Brilliant. And usually, I mean, if you, generally, if you get a poem, you have time to research it, so you probably Google, like, interpretation of white man's burden. Um, if you do that with Robert Service, nothing will come up because no one ever talks about him, which is really sad because his poems are really cool. Anyway, moving on. Um, if there are, are there other, other questions concerning poetry? Because if not, I'm going to move on to my, um, for a second, I want to say personal least favorite part, um, but uh, one of the sort of more famous, more familiar to you kinds of genres that is the novel. Um, fun, fun, fun. Let me just take, get my notes ready and then, okay. Um, again, we are still kind of in the romantic period, so I'm going to be using um, excerpts from mostly from the 19th and 18th century, but I'm going to explain most of things like narration, focalization, etc., etc., by the help of one um, excerpt and one novel that you know, that is um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, so I'm going to focus mostly on that. Um, it's good that at least some of you got, yay, <laughs> at least a novel uh, people actually know, and it's not John Milton that no one really knows. Anyway, um, first of all, what is a novel? Again, I'm always starting with definitions and, you know, uh, spoiler alert, we don't have the sort of um, 
definition of a novel, but I'm going to give you a quote by Virginia Woolf, not just that you've ever read Virginia Woolf, but mostly because she describes the novel um, more or less exactly as it is. She says that the cannibal, the novel, which has devoured so many forms of art, will by then have devoured even more. We shall be forced to invent new names for the different books which masquerade under this one heading. And it is possible that there will be among these so-called novels one which we uh, shall scare know how to Christian. It will be written in prose, but in prose which has so many, of, uh, so many of the characteristics of poetry, which is interesting that Wolf writes that in the beginning of the 20th century, when in fact we know sort of novels or works that are written in poetic language or in the, the sense and the structure of poetry, but are actually narratives. So the novel isn't something that simply appears in the 18th century with Jane Austen and suddenly bam, we've got the novel, but it has precursors, and two precursors in particular. One is the epic, and one is the romance. So when it comes to the epic, the epic is something you know, it's um, a, a longish ballad. It's written usually in uh, poetic language, as in the structure of a poem. It rhymes, it has internal rhymes, etc., etc. but it usually tells a grander narrative. So it's usually very long, it's not brief, um, there are often directly described sort of lyrical eyes or addresses, or addresses, so to speak, within the poem, so it tells a longish story. Usually the epic has at its core a hero, a hero that has a larger goal than himself. So it's not necessarily a fleshed out character with you know, uh, own and individual motivations, but that hero has a larger goal. So usually um, during the, um, if you, if you look at the Arthurian legend or the Green Knight, the Green Knight, Gavin, has a larger goal and a larger motive that does not necessarily have to do something with his own intrinsic motivation, but that's usually he's being put on a quest that has mythological, historical, or religious sorts of functions or um, goals. So that is the epic. So we've got still written in, in uh, poetry or written in, in sort of poetic form, but telling a grander narrative, which with a pretty sort of, I don't want to call it a flat character, but with a very simple and narrowly um, defined kind of hero. With later on, especially with, I think, in the late um, Old English, uh, Middle English period, we see the sort of occurrence of the Romans. And the Romans changes things a little because suddenly the plot is much more focused. It's not about, you know, a grand goal, but it is about a unified plot, a very goal-oriented plot, because the point of a romance isn't that there's some kind of mythical goal the hero has to fulfill, but it's, you know, about having a happy ending in the end, sort of getting the girl and then ending on a happy note. Um, so the, the scope of it is mu it's not as broad as the epic. It's not about heroes, and it's not about journeying across the world. If you look at Homer's epics, uh, for instance, the Odyssey, that's not necessarily what we find in a Romans story. It's much more contained, much narrower. Um, the scope is not as broad, the plot is usually unified, and the character is much more individualistic. The point isn't that the hero is the sort of blank slate where you can proje uh, project any kinds of motivations onto him, and he's not this grand hero that is always triumphant even when he fails, but we have the flaws of the character, and the human flaws in, this, in, in particular are being put, uh, put to the forefront of the Roman's narrative. So if we look at both the grand scale narrative of the epic as well as the much more focused narrative of the Romans, you can kind of see where the novel starts to develop from. So both the Romans story or the Romans narration as well as the epic sort of anticipate the novel even before the novel actually occurs. And the novel or the precursors or the earliest novels occur in Spain in the, uh, not in the 19th century, but in the 17th century. So Don Quixote, for instance, would be one of the earlier novels. And eventually, as it's usually the case with anything concerning British literature, it comes from the continent. So this idea and the sort of writing of the novel eventually moves on to the British Isles, where, especially in the 18th century, we see far more novels than we've seen before. So if I just go back to 
um, the slide you've seen a couple of times now. We are still right in the middle of the Romantic period. We have still the turn away from the courts. So the focus of the novel is not any longer the courts. It's not necessarily the aristocracy, but it's either the common men or especially in the uh, 19th century, in the late 18th century, the sort of empowered middle class. So the novel in the 18th and 19th century is not just a very popular genre for readers in the sense of they kind of see themselves within it because the experiences that are being mediated through the novel aren't necessarily those of the upper class but of those that actually buy the novels and read them. Um, together with the printing press, the novel pretty quickly spreads throughout, not just throughout Europe, but throughout uh, the British Isles. And it's not just a popular genre for the readers, it's much shorter, it's much easier accessible, it's much easier to read, it's much more variable because you've got a different, you've got different subgenres that can be sort of, that can be looked at from the perspective and written in prose as a novel. So you've got detective novels, utopian novels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that kind of sort of crop up during that time. But it's also for writers themselves because poetry is still pretty inaccessible for most writers. It's still, if you you know, if you publish anthologies, that would usually work. But for the larger public, poems, epics. Um, Etc. They are not or even plays are not necessarily easy to read. So the accessibility of the novel also means that it's bought and consumed much more often. So it becomes a pretty profitable thing for writers to do. So that is, and it's usually you can't really say that you know we see the author the first time in the 18th century, but it's usually during the 18th and 19th century where the author as we know him or her nowadays, namely as the genius behind the work, sort of starts to crop up. And that has, is very tightly uh, connected to the question of consumability of the novel and of sort of the idea of actually being able to become a writer full time. Because most of the writers of the 17th century, 16th century, they had day-to-day -day jobs. They were either at the courts, they were scribes, they were working as lawyers, etc., etc. And writing came second-hand, or basically um, as a second thought. They still wrote, but not as their main job. And this is something that changes rapidly in the 18th and 19th century, because suddenly people can afford to live on their own writing. Whether that's Charles Dickens, who publishes in, at that point still in, in installments, so it's a serial publishing where you get for each installment, you get paid for that, which is why if you read Charles Dickens' novels right now, at each and every chapter you have a kind of weird summary. So in the last chapter, this and that and that happened, where you go like, mm, I've just finished the chapter, I still know what happened. But that's because you know they were compiled afterwards after they had already been published in installments, which is actually a pretty ingenious move. You first publish it in installments, and then you publish an anthology, so you sell twice as many, or you basically sell the same story twice, just um, one is spread out and the other one is as an anthology. So it's like a box set of any series, you watch it um, as in, in, in episodes and then you buy the entire box set, so you pay twice basically for the same episode. Anyway, um, but this is sort of the precursor of novels as well as the sort of rise of the novel in the 18th and 19th century. Um, and when we were talking, or when I was talking about poetry, I gave you this sort of communication model, where you've got the uh, fictive, uh, fictive speaker, the lyrical I, the subject matter of speech, and the lyrical tau, which is pretty simple. I mean, it's not as simple as sender and receiver, but it's still pretty simple-ish, at least. With the novel, that becomes a bit more detailed. Not difficult, but certainly detailed, because suddenly uh, the the sort of lyrical eye or the narrator isn't necessarily the character that's actually speaking in the novel. So we have a different layer that is added right in between. That is the intratextual level right um, in between, namely that the level of characters and the story. Usually you have a narrator that tells, so basically you've got the real historical author, um, I'm taking J.K. Rowling as an example, it's not necessarily a historical author, but an author. Um, and she has a narrator within Harry Potter, which is not the same person as J.K. Rowling. It's a narrator that narrates Harry Potter. And within the novel, basically within Harry Potter, um, there are characters that speak. So there are Harry and Hermione. They do have a dialogue. They do 
um, Harry in this case would be the sender when, or with, with Hermione being the, um, the receiver. But this is set in a larger context where the narrator is addressing you as the implied reader or an implied reader, not necessarily you because you are still the receiver. Um, so there are different levels of dialogue and different levels of communication that happen within a novel that are a little bit more detailed than that we find in poetry, which is both due to the brevity of poetry, um, to the form of poetry, and of course to the entire setup. A poem doesn't necessarily need to tell a narrative, whereas a novel should necessarily tell you some kind of narrative. Um, which also, are there any questions by the way? So if, if everything is written in like Moby Dick style, call me Ishmael, I was there doing this, that, and the other. Or, um, well, if we, if we let's, let's imagine Harry Potter would be written in first person narration. I, Harry Potter, live with the Dursleys, which would be awful to read. Anyway, um, but then again, the sender would still be the historical author, JK Rowling. Um, she writes a story, whereas a narrator, which could be Harry, I, Harry Potter, do this, that, and the other. Um, this is where sort of the fictive narrator and the character as an addressee would sort of kind of blur, simply because it's a character that is set in the same story. So it would more or less be still a character because we can't really know whether Harry that writes, or in this case it would be I, Harry Potter, lived with the Dursleys. Just imagine it's still written in first person narration, but the, uh, it's not in present tense, but in past tense. Then it would imply Harry is now older and he has lived at some point in his past, lived with the Dursleys. So Harry, as, a, you know, as an older man, for instance, would be the narrator. Whereas Harry, in his younger years, I spoke to Hermione that day, would be the character as an addresser. And this is something similar, even if it's written in present tense, because even in present tense, you know, writing takes place after the thing has happened. Um, so there's always the implied narrator who tells this story afterwards. You usually don't tell stories, you don't go write everything down, um, even then it would be sort of after the fact that it has, ha has happened. So there's, even if it's in first person narration, um, and again I'm going back to, to Moby Dick for instance, it starts, the book literally starts with, call me Ishmael, I was blah, and then he talks about his voyage and the sort of hunt for the white whale. Um, but in this case, Ishmael, after the fact he's been on this voyage, writes the story. It's still the same person, and it's still the same character, but at different points in time. So this is usually, um, again, the lines may be blurred, but even in first-person narration, you usually have a older or an older and a younger kind of character that tells the story. So who tells the story and who sees it does not necessarily have to be the same person. Okay? Brilliant. Any other questions? Okay? That does not seem to be the case, which is why I'm going to move on and confuse you a little further. You remember, <laughs> yes, oh, sorry about that. You of course remember that I said something about discourse and discourse being the way we define things from certain perspectives and from certain viewpoints, right? Okay, brilliant. Um, usually that is not included in the introduction to literature studies simply because people tend to be confused between the Foucauldian discourse, which we've talked about, you know, remember the small Yoda figure, and the narrative discourse. It's still kind of ish the same thing because um, narrative can usually be separate. I know, it's, I'm going to hopefully explain and I hope it will make sense. Um, usually, you know, generally I would recommend you to remember the Foucauldian discourse and not the narrative discourse. Anyway, um, and if I ever ask you in a later seminar, what is discourse, and you go like, it's how a story is told, I'm um, not going to be pleased. Anyway, a narrative can usually separate it in both a story or the story level and the discourse level. The story level is pretty simple. It's what is being told in this narrative. Whereas the discourse, and again, this is why I sort of shoehorn the Foucauldian discourse back in. We said that it, is, it provides us with a certain language of how to talk about certain things. So discourse on a narrative level kind of does the same. It's 
how the story is told, from whose perspective is it told, through whose eyes is it told, who tells the story, where is that person situated, etc., etc. So it's kind of the same, but not really. Um, again, I'm going to make plain, if I say narrative discourse, you know, it's about narrative and the story and how it's being told from a you know, time frame, uh, narr narrator, etc., etc. And if I say Foucauldian discourse, I mean something slightly different. So again, the story is the sequence of events that happen throughout a book or throughout a narrative, whereas the discourse is sort of the inherent or the how a story is told as well as the inherent logic of the tale. Um, again, just to make it simple, it's about what is being told, that's the story, and about how it's being told. So if we have Harry Potter, Harry Potter can be told from different perspectives. We only know one, namely Harry's perspective. The story about Philosopher's Stone, for instance, would, would be the same. Um, it doesn't matter if it's told from Ron's perspective or Hermione's perspective. Some things might change some events, but overall, the story would be the same. The same sequence of events, right? but it can be told from different viewpoints. So Harry's story, the how Harry tells a story, how he sees things is very different from how Hermione sees things. Just if we look at Snape, for instance, Harry doesn't necessarily like Snape, he distrusts him, but Hermione would not call Snape a liar or dishonest or anything because she would view him as an authority or as an, a figure of authority. So simply the way she describes it, the way she tells the story, the how of it, would be different depending on the viewpoint. So same story can be told from different discourses, so to speak, can be told uh, in different manners and from different viewpoints. Does that make sense? Brilliant. Which is why I'm going to move on because um, you can see it's kind of um, at the top. So there's more. And we're going to focus on the story part first. So stories are usually this is just, again, the what is being told, the sequence of events. Not necessarily the motivation and the inherent logic of it, but sort of just what happens at which point. First, Harry gets his letter, then he goes to Gringotts, then he boards the train, then this happens. It doesn't say Harry gets his letter and because he wants to be a wizard, he goes there. So the uh, motivation in between would, for instance, be more of the question of the discourse and the narrative. That's a plot and not necessarily the story. So the story consists of events and existence. So the events are actions. Actions or events in general, those are the smallest units of a narrative. It's just Harry does this, Harry does that. And there are two kinds of actions, two kinds of happenings, so to speak, or two kinds of events. Those that are necessary for the plot and those that are not necessary for the plot or that are satellite events. So the important and the sort of yeah, the, the, the essential um, plot points or the essential events are, for instance, uh, Voldemort kills James and Lily. The same story, Harry Potter wouldn't be the same story if that didn't happen in the beginning, because that is sort of the, the first part um, where the story actually begins. Harry would be a completely different character if this event hadn't happened. So that is an essential event for the story. It's an essential plot point, so to speak. However, that um, Aunt Petunia tries to hit Harry with a frying pan in Chamber of Secrets isn't necessarily an important event. That could be left out. You know, for unimportant or satellite events, they don't need to be in the narrative. They are nice but unnecessary. You could omit them and the story wouldn't change. It wouldn't change. Chamber of Secrets would still progress the way it does even if Petunia hadn't tried to hit Harry with a frying pan. However, if you take out Dobby, that would not work. So if Dobby didn't take his letters, Chamber of Secrets would progress probably very differently. So again, you have two kinds of events, those that are necessary and essential for the narrative and those that are not. On the sort of second strand, the existence is simply characters and setting. Who is in the narrative and where does the narrative take place? And you can do that basically for every scene. If you have... Um, if you have film or theater, you have the setting would be, for instance, the decor and everything that happens around the characters. And again, the setting can be temporal and spatial. And just to make that plain as an example, I do have an example, which is again from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I'm just going to read parts of it and not the entire thing. Um, so 
Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large boy uh, riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house, too. Yet Harry Potter was still, uh, was still there, still alive, well, at this point at least, um, uh, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Get up, get up now. Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped um, on the door again. Up, she shrieked. Um, just going to leave it there. I'm going to give you five minutes, and what I want you to do is figure out who are the characters, what is the setting, both spatial, where does it take place, and temporal, when does it take place, and then just kind of go through the events that happen. I don't want you to go through all the events, but through, through some of them. So what happens in this excerpt, what are the events, and what are the existence, character, setting, etc. Five minutes. All right, not quite five minutes, I'll give you that. But just really quick, what are the events that happen? And just a few of them, not all of them. But what's the sequence of events in the story? Mm 
Okay, so you can you know do that really minuscule. So the sun rises, then this happens and that happens. But yeah, absolutely. Um, what about the characters in uh, this excerpt? So just I think. So we've done the action and events. Um, what about characters? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, what about the spatial and temporal setting? Yeah. And the temporal setting is 10 years after World War II, it's still in Greece. Yeah. Uh, and for Harry and Tom, and then it's still the set. And the spatial setting is the Jackie from the past. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to give you what I had. It's exactly that. We have the events um, and action. Sort of time has passed, Harry is asleep. Uh, Petunia is awake, Petunia makes a noise, Petunia screeches at him, uh, Harry wakes up, etc., etc. The spatial setting is, as you so rightly said, it's a, d a private drive, the Dursley home, number four, could be simply seen as a middle class home, which is kind of conveyed by brass, number, the neat front garden, and the pictures in the living room. Uh, the spatial setting is somewhere in the 1990s, which is 10 years after uh, James and Lily were killed, which is in, I think, early uh, 1980, 1981, something like that. And the characters are Petunia, Mr. Dursley, very hidden in some kind of side um, sentence or kind of side reference, uh, Harry and Dudley. And when it comes to the characterization of them, we see that Harry is far more in-depth portrayed and far more characterized than, for instance, his aunt. His aunt is more or less a type, simply or similarly to, to Dudley Dursley. Dudley, um, Mr. Dursley, as well as Petunia Dursley, are at least in the first three to four uh, books very flat characters. They are mostly types. They can be described by one simple sentence. Dudley is the bully. Um, Vernon Dursley is the uncle and the bully. So that is pretty simple. But Harry is far more complex. So we have round characters and flat characters. Round characters are those that have some kind of inherent complexity. They can be described or cannot be described in one sentence because Harry is a lot more than just a type, whereas most of the other characters in the books, if you think, for instance, of Umbridge, Umbridge is a type. She's just this awful teacher that no one likes. Um, and you, there is no real complexity. Uh, Harry Potter, the series, does never go into more detail about Umbridge's motivation, about her past, etc., etc. It's very flat, it's very narrow, um, and that stands in contrast to the protagonists or the co-protagonists of the Harry Potter series. So being a round or flat character kind of depends on what kind of character you are and what your function for the narrative is. Sometimes that there are also flat characters in the sense of protagonists. If you think of the Lethal Weapon movies, which I'm even not quite sure if that popular cultural reference really works, because not everyone might know that. But I'm just, you know, if you ever want to find out what I meant by that, just kind of Google it in this case. But the main protagonists are super flat characters. Or think of, of uh, Die Hard. Um, the main character isn't necessarily one that has a lot of complexity. Um, but it does, the, the, the genre in this case, the detective novel or the detective thriller, does not really need a round character with a lot of depth and complexity. But it needs a type, someone, a blank slate, like the hero of the epic, so to speak, where we can project certain motivations onto them. But generally, if the character is a protagonist, if he's at the center of the narrative, the character is usually more complex than just being a type. Um, again, we could argue that Harry Potter would be a very different um, book or a very different novel if it was written and told from the perspective of Umbridge, which I now would like to read. Anyway, um, but before I go into more depth on characterization, etc., etc., or before I move on to discourse, I'm going to end uh, the session here. Just for reference, next week there won't be um, an introductory lecture, but we'll see each other in two weeks' time. So next week, no lecture, but the week after, there will be a lecture. Um, so I'm going to see you in two weeks' time, same place, same time. Um, have a good week, and see you then. <laughs>